Hi, I'm Dr. Jessica Bernacki, clinical psychologist for UCLA's Gender Health Program. And I'm Dr. Amy Weimer, the medical director and co-director for UCLA's Gender Health Program. And today we're going to talk about gender identity development and medical options for youth with gender dysphoria. During this talk, you can ask questions on Twitter using the hashtag UCLAMDChat or comment via YouTube. Okay, and our goals for today are to provide an overview of gender identity development in youth, discuss the options available for managing gender dysphoria. We like to start off with um, distinguishing uh, between gender identity, sex assigned at birth, and sexual orientation. So sex assigned at birth is um, typically someone being labeled as male or female at birth, commonly based on genitalia. And gender identity is a person's internal sense of sex assigned at birth or may have a gender identity that's different than their sex assigned at birth, which is what we're going to be focusing on today. Um, and then sexual orientation is its own um, experience entirely, which has to do more with how someone is romantically or emotionally attracted to other people. And what's important to note here is that someone may feel a little bit feminine and a lot masculine. It's not, it, it's not necessarily one or another. So we often get asked about when does gender identity develop? When can kids start to know if there's a difference between how they identify and how they're being labeled by other people, typically based on their sex assigned at birth? And um, we know that around one year of age, youth can show gendered preferences for type of play. And between a year and a half and two years of age, youth start to often label themselves as either a boy or a girl. You may see that around age two years, a kid might start to express some dislike um, or discomfort with the label that they are being given by other people. So you may start to hear youth say, you know, I'm, I'm not a boy, I'm a girl. And then typically youth have a stable sense of their gender identity between age four to five, although we know that this may be different for gender diverse or youth or youth who have gender dysphoria. Um, and we know adolescence is another key time point in which we may start to see um, some evidence of kind of individuals kind of thinking about their gender identity and maybe noticing that there's a difference between how they are being labeled and how they identify. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So it's important to highlight different things that you may observe in a kid with um, kind of gender dysphoria. There's kind of gender non-conforming behavior, which again is a behavioral phenomenon. So these are youth who are showing behaviors that are um, different than what we would societally expect a youth to display based on their sex assigned at birth. And then there is gender dysphoria, which is really an identity phenomenon. So youth who really um, describe a difference between how they're being kind of labeled by other people and how they truly identify themselves to be in terms of like male or female or something else. Um, and we're really gonna focus on gender dysphoria, although youth who have gender dysphoria will often show gender non-conforming behaviors. Um, and again, we typically see signs of gender dysphoria or kids coming to us talking about gender dysphoria at kind of two main age points. So there are early prepubertal youth around you know, early childhood um, who are starting to show signs, again, coinciding with that identity development around age, you know, say four, um, who are having that um, discomfort with how they're being identified and kind of talking about that. And then there's adolescents who um, are often coming to gender uh, clinics like ours and talking about the sense that their gender is not um, how they are identified at birth and, and starting to talk about distress. And that's often coinciding with the changes that happen with puberty and the feminization or masculinization of the body that's happening at that time and that not aligning with how they identify. So we often also get asked, you know, how do we know that my child who has this difference in their gender identity or this, this incongruence in their gender identity with their sex assigned at birth, how do we know if that will persist for them into adolescence and into adulthood? Um, and there are some, some ways in which we can feel um, 
this is more likely to persist. So the more insistent, consistent, and persistent a youth might be, the more um, likely that this will persist for that person in the long term. We know that for youth who experience an onset of this dysphoria or an intensification of this dysphoria in adolescence, that that's a strong predictor. So again, when bodies are changing with puberty, if that is not aligning with how a person identifies, again, that's a strong predictor that that distress would persist if they were to continue in that puberty. And then um, body dissatisfaction. So youth who have gender dysphoria are more likely to talk about dissatisfaction with specific parts of their body, and typically the parts of their body that are more gendered. So typically relating to the chest, the chest or the genitals. And then often we're hearing things about a person's identity. So if a youth is telling you, I am a boy or I am a girl, um, rather than talking about, well, I want to get to do the boy activities, um, that may be a sign that it is more likely to persist. It's more about their kind of core sense of who they are. So I mentioned we were going to talk about family support today. And the reason we are going to focus so much on family support is because we know it is kind of a strong predictor of well-being for LGBTQ, LGBTQ youth broadly. Um, and there's a couple graphics that I think are really kind of um, powerful to show you kind of what the research has demonstrated about the importance of youth having kind of supportive family members or supportive people in their lives. Um, so we know that youth who identify as LGBTQ who come from extremely accepting families, that a majority of them, over 90%, will describe seeing the future for themselves as being, that they see themselves as a happy adult. Whereas youth who come from um, completely unaccepting families, only a third envision that kind of positive future for themselves. And then we also know that LGBTQ youth who um, Come from, incredible, come from highly rejecting families, also experience an eight times greater risk of a lifetime suicide attempt than youth who come from um, very accepting families or families with low rejection. So we often get asked, you know, what is the best way to support our child um, as a parent? And, you know, many parents come to us believing that the best thing for their kid would be to help them to kind of fit in with their cisgender or non-transgender peers. So they encourage their kids for a period of time to conform. So um, you know, play with the toys that are stereotypical for, you know, their assigned sex at birth. Um, play with those type, you know, those peers. Um, but most parents often find that this does not go well, and many youth describe this as um, feeling quite um, negative and, and experiencing rejection um, with this. And, and you know, this experience of rejection can be associated with some of those kind of negative results that I alluded to before, which was kind of poor outlook for their ability to be kind of a happy person in the future um, and increased risks for um, things like anxiety and depression and suicide risk. So what we want to you know, spend the rest of the time of our talk doing, what Dr. Rima will, will take over with now, is talking about what are the options and for supporting transgender youth? Um, what are the best ways to support them? Options available to us to support them? Thank you. So since we spent a little bit of time talking about gender identity development, how to determine somebody's stability of gender identity, and the importance of family support and acceptance, now we want to talk about how does that apply to you and to your child. Um, and the most important thing to recognize is that every person's experience is going to be different and every child's needs are going to be different. So the most important thing that we can do is really listen to that child, what it is that's causing them discomfort and in what way can we best support them. And social transition is the process by which a person um, changes how they present to the world to live in their affirmed gender role. So this might mean changing their hairstyle, changing their style of dress, changing their name and pronouns, and um, even making legal document changes with name and gender marker so that these match their affirmed gender role. And social transitioning can be a very, very powerful intervention, um, particularly in youth. 
there was one wonderful study that was published a few years ago that showed that young people, so these were children before puberty who were allowed to socially transition and live in their affirmed gender role, when they were evaluated in later adolescence had similar rates of depression and only slightly higher rates of anxiety than their same aged non-transgender peers. So it can be a very powerful intervention. Aside from social transitioning, there are a number of other ways to help a person live in their affirmed gender, and these have more to do with aligning their body so that their body reflects their affirmed gender. And when we're talking about pursuing this in young people, the first question that we need to answer is, where are they in puberty? Um, and we use a stage called the Tanner stage, um, or a scale called the Tanner scale, that, that divides puberty into five different stages, with Tanner stage one being a child who hasn't started puberty at all, and Tanner stage five being a child who has completed puberty. Um, and this is based on a physical exam. When we do the physical exam for children with gender dysphoria, it can be a very emotionally challenging time uh, because they may have a tremendous amount of discomfort with their bodies. So we really need to approach this in a sensitive way. In addition, we support this um, staging with lab tests that look at where hormone levels are at. So once we've determined the Tanner stage that a child is in, then we can start to make decisions about what options are available. So a child who's Tanner stage one, who hasn't yet had any puberty changes, there's no medical treatment that's indicated at this point. Um, and this is for a couple of reasons. One is that we don't wanna start any medications that aren't necessary to start. And if the body isn't developing in a way that doesn't align with the gender identity, it's not necessary to start medications yet. But we also know that those early pubertal times are very important for helping us clarify whether this child is likely to have persistent gender dysphoria. So if their discomfort about their body intensifies around the time of puberty onset, that's a strong predictor. Um, and if we start interventions very early in puberty, then we really haven't lost any ground in helping this child. So at Tanner stage one, really what we're looking at is supporting this child in socially transitioning, if that would be something that might alleviate their discomfort. For kids who are Tanner stage two, three, or four, so these are children who have started puberty but have not yet completed puberty, then we can use what are often referred to as blockers or medications to suppress puberty. And these medications are fully reversible and essentially put a pause button on puberty so that it stays where it's at. Um, and they can be used for months to years alone without any other interventions and are fully reversible. So they're a very useful tool um, for a number of reasons. One is that it can give the child and family and providers more time to have discussions and clarify what the best path is gonna be for this individual child and help the child to reach an age where their decision-making might be a little bit more mature and, and future-oriented. Um, and they also can prevent changes that might come from allowing puberty to continue that would require or necessitate surgeries in later life. But we know that puberty is important. It's important for our general health and our brain development. And so at some point, we need to make a decision to move forward with puberty. So if that child, after reflecting on this, decides that they actually want to resume their own puberty, then we can stop the blockers and puberty will proceed where it left off. In reality, this doesn't happen very often. Most kids who are put on puberty blockers are put on puberty blockers because they have significant gender dysphoria, and we know that that usually does not resolve on its own with time. So the other option is for kids who desire to continue their gender transition, then we actually continue the blockers so that changes from the body's own programmed puberty don't proceed, and we start hormone therapy. So hormone therapy um, is, we either do this in kids who have been put on the blockers and are at Tanner stage two to four, or kids who have completed puberty and are at Tanner stage five. And essentially we use these hormones to induce changes in the body that are more in line with the person's gender identity. So for trans feminine people, people who were assigned male at birth and have a more female gender identity, 
we use a form of estrogen called estradiol, and then we pair that with another medication to either block or bring down testosterone levels. For kids who are already on puberty blockers, the puberty blockers will serve that latter role. And for transmasculine people, so people assigned female at birth who are transitioning to a more male gender expression, we use testosterone. Um, and generally, we don't need to pair this with another medication to bring down estrogen levels. But again, if somebody's already on blockers, we do continue the blockers. And we, in children, we gradually increase these doses of hormones to sort of mimic the experience of puberty. If a child is at an older age when they start, then we may do that dose escalation a bit faster. But in this way, we're trying to um, help these children have an experience that's more in line with their peers. Aside from hormone therapy, there are a number of surgeries that people might seek in order to align their bodies more with their gender identity. And I've put here the common terms that are often used. Top surgery refers to chest reconstruction. Um, and it's more commonly pursued in people who are transmasculine, where they have the removal of most of their breast tissue and a reconstruction of the chest to a more masculine appearance. It can also be pursued in transfeminine people where it's more of a classic breast augmentation surgery. Bottom surgery refers to genital reconstruction um, or really any surgeries that are done on the reproductive tract. Um, and that can be done just for hormone management by removing sort of the hormone making factories of the body or to get the genitals more in line with one's gender identity. Facial feminization is facial reconstruction to feminize um, what may be seen as very masculine fa facial features. And then the tracheal shave refers to a reduction in the size of the Adam's apple. And these latter two surgeries are a great example of surgeries that could be avoided if we put a child on blockers before they reach about Tanner stage four, which is where we start to see a lot of the bony changes that come along with testosterone-based puberty. So how, what do we know about the outcomes of all of these interventions? Uh, we have a number of studies that really support positive health outcomes in people who have access to hormones and to surgeries. And specific to children, when studies have been done on adults who were given um, pubertal suppression in adolescence, followed by hormones and surgeries, those studies show that the adults have significant improvements in their gender dysphoria as well as their general psychological functioning. And this is really important because we know that rates of depression, anxiety, and suicidality are all markedly increased in the transgender population. So interventions where we can reduce those particular conditions are very powerful interventions. So very good and effective interventions. Many patients and families ask us, how much will all of these treatments cost and will my insurance cover it? And the short answer is it varies depending on where you live and what your insurance plan is. Uh, the Affordable Care Act does have a non-discrimination clause, which includes a prohibition on discrimination on the basis of sex. But whether that term sex refers to gender identity is often debated. And in fact, the Supreme Court is currently considering three cases where they're trying to make a determination about just that question. And that ruling is expected out next year, which hopefully will clarify things. But for now, uh, some states have a specific non-discrimination clause um, within their state, and other states do not. Um, so some health plans will cover these services, and some will not. The insurances that do cover it typically use a document called the Standards of Care from the World Professional Association for Transgender Health as the basis for authorizing certain procedures. And these guidelines um, give some recommendations for, um, for uh, readiness criteria that a person should meet before proceeding with certain interventions. Um, and it's important to be aware of this because it is so often referred to by insurance companies. Um, if a service gets denied by insurance company, the patient can appeal, the provider can appeal, um, patients can actually file complaints with the Department of Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights on the basis of discrimination, and we have seen a number of denials overturned when patients have taken this step. 
Um, patients can engage a legal advocate, which can be a very, very useful tool. And there are advocacy organizations that may offer these services free of charge. Um, and there's a great summary of how to approach this process online at transgenderlawcenter.org, which is in and of itself a very, very helpful resource. In the state of California, which is where we practice, there is indeed uh, an Insurance Gender Non-Discrimination Act in place, which mandates that services that are provided for other medical indications are also provided as part of gender transition if they're medically indicated. So there are some wonderful protections in place in California. And I think it's important to note that this is part of a larger gender, gender non-discrimination uh, act in this state that also provides protections in a variety of different settings, including schools. So if children are having difficulty um, accessing specific things in schools, for instance, safe bathroom access, they should know that there is legislation in place that should give them those protections. Um, so we just wanted to take a moment uh, recognizing how important parental and family support is for the outcomes for these children. Just to thank everybody who's watching this webinar because you are taking a very, very powerful step to help your kids have a happy and healthy life. And this is our contact information. Feel free to reach out with any questions. And I think we might have some questions available to us. So one question is, what are the long-term health risks of hormone therapy? This is a very common question that we get, um, especially from parents who are really looking out for their children's long-term health. Um, and generally, hormone therapy is actually very safe. With estrogen, the one medical concern that we um, really keep an eye on is that it can increase the risk for, for dangerous blood clot formation. And this is strongly associated with smoking. So staying away from smoking is very important for anyone who's on estrogen for any reason. But aside from that, long-term studies have shown there's no increased risk in cancer of any kind, no increased risk in heart attack, no increased risk in diabetes, and then in transmasculine patients, no increased risk in stroke. In transfeminine patients, there is a slight increased risk of stroke related to that predisposition to blood clot formation. Um, here's another question. What is required before an adolescent can have top surgery? Do they need to be on hormones or to see a psychologist? So most gender-affirming surgeries people don't pursue before the age of 18. Um, and the one notable exception is top surgery in adolescent transmasculine patients because it can be very challenging to go through life as a teenage guy with breasts. Um, and um, it can be very tricky because many insurances will not cover it, so this is a place where we really do a lot of appeals work. For readiness for top surgery, um, it is not mandatory that, that people be on hormones um, because the hormones and the breast development isn't really affected by being on hormones. Um, it's not medically necessary. However, a number of surgeons that I've spoken with will say that they feel like if uh, somebody is on testosterone for perhaps about a year and does some work on building the muscles of the chest, this can help them with their surgical technique really align the scars with a person's anatomy and help make the result perhaps a little bit better. Um, but there are people who want to pursue, the, uh, pursue top surgery and never start hormones, and that is also an option. Um, and then in regards to working with a psychologist, I'll pass that to Dr. Bernacki. Yeah, um, so currently in our, in our program and I think um, many of the programs that we um, have seen patients participate in, therapy is not necessarily um, a requirement in terms of someone having been in therapy for a certain amount of time. Um, but there is a role for a behavioral health provider usually in this care in that um, it is currently, as part of the standard of care guidelines, a requirement that individuals for insurance coverage have a statement of support, typically from a behavioral health provider. Um, so 
you know, youth who are interested in pursuing transmasculine top surgery will often have to provide a statement of support written by a therapist or psychiatrist or other mental health provider um, documenting that readiness for surgery. Um, so often that is where we'll become involved is to help do that documentation to help pursue insurance coverage. Um, and then this question, after surgery, how long do I need to continue hormone therapy and how does that affect sexual activities? Um, and so this I think would be specific to probably bottom surgery. Um, we ideally want a person to be on some sort of hormone for most of their life. Again, for general health, um, it probably it definitely impacts bone health and probably cardiovascular and brain health as well. And so ideally, we don't want to remove a person's own gonads, which is where we make hormones, unless they feel very committed to continuing the hormones that they're taking. Um, so in this question, how long do I need to continue hormone therapy? The answer would be indefinitely. We don't really know the best guidelines for people who reach an older age where naturally the hormone levels would decline in our bodies. And at this point, that's a very individualized discussion with, with each patient, but we do often reduce the hormone doses um, in later life. Um, and as far as sexual activities, um, sex is affected tremendously by everything that we do. Um, and that's probably multifactorial. Some of it is coming as a direct result of hormones. For instance, testosterone definitely makes sex drive go up. Um, but some of it also is related to a person feeling more comfortable in their own body as their body changes to align with their gender identity. Um, and so our goal is as we go through these treatments and as we go through genital surgeries that people have very full and functional sex lives. So all of these steps that we take ideally would only be enhancing sexual function. Thank you again for being here today. And if there are any um, ongoing questions you may have or anything else you feel like we may be able to help you with, we do hope you reach out and contact our program. And thank you very much. Thank you.